Okay, we will get started today on our semi bi monthly RHEL seminar. And it's been a pleasure with these RHEL seminars to bring in speakers from outside the organization because there's a lot working in the Colorado area or visiting. But it's also a very special privilege to have people within our organization present, including today Andy Newman, Dr. Andy Newman, who uh, comes to us from uh, CSU with his PhD there that he did under Richard Johnson. Uh, he has a bachelor's and master's from University of North Dakota prior to that, and currently is a project scientist three. So many of you know him from the Hydro Met Applications Program and does work in all kinds of areas. I was just taking a look at his CV, it was very impressive. Works in regional climate modeling, hydrometeorological data sets, climate impacts, hydrology, stream flow, floods, and that's just recent work. Has over uh, has like 68 publications I saw, so very impressive. And without further ado, anyway, I'll let Andy take over and present to us. Great, yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, thanks for the really nice uh, introduction. Um, yeah, I. Uh, all my degrees are atmospheric science, so I was very non-interdisciplinary going through school. I mean, I was subdisciplinary, but we'll talk about interdisciplinarity here a lot today. So I'm thinking about actionable hydrometeorological climate change research. So this is just a part of what I do. Um, I think third-ish by project totals, because I don't want to overwhelm everybody. But anyway, you know, the, the real, thing that gives you the opportunity to give talk like this is all your collaborators and teams that you get to be a part of. And so I just want to acknowledge, uh, I hope I didn't forget everybody and in every institution. I tried to double check this and triple check this. But yeah, there's a ton of people here at NCAR. These are mainly focused on, on RAL um, with Andy Woodup and CGD. Um, and then a lot of external partners, universities, agencies, uh, tribal partners. Um, community partners, uh, yeah, it's it's really fun to, to work on projects like this with a very diverse set of partners and scientists, and just uh, it's uh, it's very exciting to get to share that out with everybody today. So, a quick outline: we'll try to motivate everybody in the room. You probably all know the motivation of, of a lot of of what this talk's going to be, but then. Uh, shift into more of the research and, and development of things and then moving that development into action. And then um, spend some time on what I've noticed across these kinds of projects. And then um, just a quick summary and hopefully time for questions. Right, so the broad brush motivation of, of this uh, work, um, the climate crisis, right? So obviously, <laughs> We have a lot of, of things happening due to anthropogenic climate change, and you know, there's an urgent a need to address all of these myriad issues. Um, a subset of them, many, you know, there are many water issues, too much, too little, how do you deal with that from an operations or impact standpoint? And so that's kind of where I, I fit most of the time and where our, our work fits most of the time. Um, and the work here will be in that, that context. But digging a little bit deeper than, um, how will anthropogenic climate change impact specific things that we're going to talk about today? So river flow, stream flow, uh, river temperature. We're not going to really touch on the temperature or the species survival, but just note that it is part of a broader project and broader motivation. And we'll have just a, we'll touch on that a little bit in kind of the context of how you build these interdisciplinary teams and some of the lessons that um, we're learning. Infrastructure design, right? So from the big agency perspective, reclamation, Army Corps of Engineers, you know, they care about how you operate and design infrastructure. Um, and then, you know, all of our research here is really, uh, you know, designed with and motivated, motivated by our, our partners and these, you know, the communities, tribal partners through federal agencies and all of this to support their decision making capabilities in some way, shape or form. And it looks different for each partner, each project, each community, which uh, is challenging. And uh, fun, right? So there's this tension, and I'll hit on that throughout the talk, there's this, always this tension of place space versus generalization or regionalization. And so um, thinking about actionable climate science and why this is like a, a thing now, um, this is, I, I feel like this 
is kind of where I see this as not like an, uh, an original thought, but right. So climate science has really got this moving target, and this is a really nice figure of the evolution of the MIPS from CMIP six to MIP X, so seven, eight, and then on into the future, right? Um, but we always feel like there's this, you know, well, what about the next MIP? What about the next advance? And so we can't ever enact climate science for some reason, but. If you think about what the weather forecasting enterprise has done, they've definitely been able to do that, right? They've implemented science advances into research all the time. Um, and so we obviously know a lot about global change. We know a lot about regional change and then moving to science to applications through a lot of the things that we do in the weather, climate, water enterprise. That's all really our end goal is to improve some kind of capability for decision making. So why, why can't we do it for climate change? And so we're really, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last 15, 20 years. And um, this is kind of the, I think, standard uh, way, I would say, is you have this roadmap. You have your, your climate scientists, your climate models. You need to do something to bring those coarse climate models down in scale, so downscaling, right? So you bring it from coarse resolution to high resolution. Um, and then that may not actually do what you actually care about, right? So impact models like hydrologic modeling. So like statistical downscaling doesn't have a hydrology model in it. So then you need to run an impact model. Well, then you're at reclamation. You need to know how to operate that installation given that guidance. So then you need to run a planning model. So there's this chain of models at all these different steps. And so a lot of the work that we've done and we're doing on these projects uh, is evaluating, you know, methods and models across these different steps. Um, but also trying to, to look at uh, how to short circuit this chain. So maybe doing more at the downscaling step, maybe trying to pull information from further up the funnel or in different parts of a, of a circle of, a, of kind of an interconnected system, right? And so that's, that's where we're, we're, I think, where we're trying to go with some of the, the work uh, here. So going further than this kind of you know, one-way roadmap, um, you know, enabling our partners to be more integrated into the climate change research enterprise. So thinking about how can everything inform everything else, it's really, again, challenging, but um, I think it gives you a better appreciation for like how your research fits in, how responsive it can be, and then also I think motivates more uh, fundamental research, right? There's questions out there that you wouldn't have thought about because you don't have the view of the decision maker or the partner institution. So starting to pivot a little bit to specific research that, that we're doing on, on these topics. Um, so this is kind of a diagram of, of this application of research, but it's kind of how um, I think I've been thinking about research uh, within RAL and, and NCAR and you know a lot of the things you see, these really kind of big interconnected enterprises. And so, right, so we have hydrometeorological climate change research in the center that builds out into like this is through the Western lens. Um, you know, core knowledges that you might need, um, core tools, core techniques or methods, um, right? And they all influence each other. And then you build out another layer to, you know, the, the things that you might do to make actionable science. And so something like maybe model development, and then you might want to assess those models. And then you can make projections once you're happy with your model and then you can turn things into actionable science or useful, usable information. And I still use useful and usable because usable is a lower bar than useful, um, right? So NetCDF file is usable, but it's not necessarily useful. Um, so I sometimes keep that distinction there, and I think that's important. Um, and then adding specific figures onto this diagram was what we'll be talking about today. Some examples from Alaska, so uh, I think a really nice example of co-design model development um, and then evaluation of, of methods and models. This is a picture of, of not the Alaska model, but a different method and evaluation of that. And then um, you can move into the projection space once you're, you're happy with your, your systems and your methods and then thinking about, you know, what is that? What does that mean from an agency perspective? And how do we develop information uh, for these actionable science questions? So thinking about 
model, regional climate model development and method development and projection development. Again, a, a, another kind of iterative uh, circle diagram. And this is through the lens of just model uh, development. So there's some specific language if you can see here. But it, you know, I think the concepts apply broadly to our kind of modeling uh, Western science lens. Um, right, so it's a spectrum. Everything's a spectrum. Everything's iterative. Uh, you know, you can range from just take WARF or CSM, default everything, and then run it and say, this is good enough. Uh, it's, you know, not really <laughs> co-design at all. You know, so maybe level one or zero, depending on if you're a, a zero index language or a one index language. Um, and then go from there, right? So you, you would operate on the spectrum of, you know, maybe you then tune your configuration with your partners. Maybe you do parameter tuning, formal or informal. Then maybe you can do localization using local ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge. And then maybe you can get all the way to co-designing parameterizations or processes or re-envisioning a model, right? And then really there could be an arrow there because then maybe that's your new out-of-the-box model. And so actually you've improved the whole chain. Um, and a lot of these projects that we'll talk about today, it's, again, what I don't want to get hung up on numbers, but kind of like in the continuum, you know, co-designing model configurations, thinking about what we really need to do to, to make a more fit or adequate for purpose model, and then going all the way through, like really developing with the real experts in the region of what we should be doing for, say, a, a future change land cover. Um, and there's a lot of things that influence that, right? All of these considerations influence our type of research, and then that influences our impact model, so the hydrologic model, the stream temperature model, the fish model. It Im impacts if it's going to be a storyline approach or a probabilistic approach, depending on, you know, what the agency or community would want or has the capacity to deal with. So a couple examples I'm going to talk about. Um, the first one is this uh, NSF Navigating the New Arctic project. Um, so the, the overarching motivation is to assess the climate sensitivity of Alaskan and Yukon rivers and fish to support resilient communities. Um, so this is working with indigenous communities in Alaska uh, primarily. So the, the idea of subsistence fisheries, uh, specifically salmon, and then if salmon aren't potentially available, what other fish species might thrive in a, in a changing Arctic, and then uh, ice transport. So. Ice roads are very important for transportation in the winter. Um, there's a lot of changes, you know, with flows and temperatures, and so ice is becoming more unsafe. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are going through the ice and and perishing. Um, I'm trying to just get around. Um, so um, this was a 2019 proposal back when NSF didn't really do planning proposals all that well. So it was really hard to build a team. So thankfully, some of our team had the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council. So the you saw the logo with the YRTWC, and we were able to bring them on as a co-PI, um, and that helped inform this initial proposal motivation and our conceptual approach of basically, okay, we know we want to get to fish modeling and ice modeling. Well, that means you need, uh, I'll go backwards here, temperature, stream flow, and good regional hydroclimate. And so how do you do that? Um, well, at the proposal stage, we looked to round and given our team expertise in that question, we said what kind of modeling systems are available. Um, and we ended up with the regional Arctic systems model, which is uh, actually a WARF atmosphere core, so it can run at high resolution at, if needed. And it's actually with the CSM1 coupler. So it's, it's an actual regional climate model, not so it's got a flexible coupling, whereas WARF sometimes is limiting in how it couples different things, right? It actually doesn't actually have an ocean model. Um, and then some of the land coupling is, is kind of buried in the, in the loop of the parameterizations. Um, so, you know, we thought this was, would give us the most flexibility. There's obviously limitations and assumptions with any modeling system. And so what are those? And then how do you mitigate those? Um, so the, the research question, this kind of motivation, and then throughout the project, the first couple of years, um, trying to interact with communities via a, a few different avenues, which we'll talk about later. Um, you know, the, the research question is focused on essentially terrestrial freshwater hydrology, right? So in RASM, the original land model was actually a pretty simple land model, really not all that 
suitable for the, the Arctic, but it was their version zero. They just needed to get something to demonstrate resin work. And so we decided as part of the proposal to move in the community terrestrial systems model, or otherwise CLM, if you're familiar with CLM, right? So this is the NCAR community land model. This has now gone into RASM um, in our project, but also fully into the RASM system. They're actually actively doing that development right now. And RASM is a DOE funded model. Um, so they have a huge team of high latitude researchers. Um, so that's great. We've been able to inform and, and help develop that model. We spent a lot of time on optimizing for hydrology, um, you know, the configurations, right? So higher resolutions, because the, if you look, this is the Yukon River. There's a lot of complex topography, right? Valleys, ridges, high precipitation, low precipitation, where snow cover seasonally, that all impacts headwaters. And so you may want to run at a higher resolution to have robust hydrology. And then things like specific hyd hydrologic things, the hill slope hydrology, that's a very non-technical term, but how do you represent north face versus south face, right? Snow stays longer on the north face just because from the energy balance versus the south face. And so there's options within CTSM um, that I don't know if they're in the main release yet, but we gave them a good test workout here in our project and it performed really well. Um, and then designing future climate experience and all experiments and then all of the things of the follow on impact models, the fish models, where do you model, what do you, what species do you model, right? And so this is all to say all this co-design can help mitigate the assumption risks of, of, you know, RASM initially with a simple land model at a course resolution wouldn't have been able to do this project. So you have to be aware of, of that and try to identify them and see how you can mitigate mitigate those things. Some of those are pretty obvious examples, but like getting into the details of op formal parameter optimization, how you would represent hill slopes is a little bit more technical. And so there's that translation of, of what a community might want all the way to a very technical modeling implementation. Right, and these are kind of in that hierarchy of, you know, at, at points in this project, again, it's a big project. It happened during the pandemic. It was a little bit disconnected. And so maybe there wasn't deep integration at points, right? So I don't give us credit for full deep integration, but I still think it's a really cool outcome and a really cool uh, demonstration of, of co-design. Maybe I'm a hard grader. Um, so the second one, this I think is a, actually a really nice example of pretty deep uh, integration. Um, this is a early career innovator project um, with uh, the Klamath River. So uh, group at University of, of Washington, um, Cleo Wolfel Hazard is the PI now at uh, UC ANR, Agricultural Natural Resource Network. Um, anyway, he has, he has his team, they have really strong connections with the Karuk tribe along the Klamath River Basin. And so they are, and if you're aware of the Klamath, they actually just had a bunch of dam removal. So now like many hundreds of miles of it are now free flowing again. And so like there's hope that the wild salmon population that still exists will actually be able to rebound. So it's really cool. And this ties into that through uh, cultural burning, right? So the Karuk used to manage this mid Klamath range, um, which is a pretty big chunk of the Klamath. Uh, that has obviously ceased. Now it's just dense pine forest, right? And I'll explain the figure here in a second, um, what the key points are. But essentially this is the mid Klamath. There's a bunch of different treatment options that they are proposing to do. There's a bunch of different vegetations, cover, land cover, or bare, and then uh, if you do a treatment, how does that change um, the makeup? And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And so basically, it's this idea of can prescribed burning, removing this dense forest, actually provide a buffer to climate change. So reducing available transpiration would improve summer low flows and stream temperatures so that when the salmon run comes back up and they come to spawn, they would actually survive and make it to the spawning grounds. Um, so we, we realized the CCSM fire model was unfit. So it's this really large scale probabilistic fire model you can't really have it evolve to represent future land cover change all that well, especially when you want to have human inter inter interventions. So then uh, we did some optimization of the hydrology using the routines from the NNA project, um, and then co-developed with, with the tribal partners what these future land cover maps would look like. And so the example here is, um, let's say you had 100% of a space was needle leaf evergreen, and then you did a treatment, you would end up with something that is a different category. So this is grass um, and then different vegetation types and you have less dense uh, evergreen needle leaf and then that would hopefully transpire left less. If you look at that spatially, so this is the grassland component 
uh, this is a zero, so you have essentially no grassland, right? So it's all dense, uh, evergreen needle leaf, right? So this is about 100%. And then after you do all the treatments on, on these different spaces, you increase your grassland, decrease your, your dense forest. And so then what is the impact on hydrology? And so that's where we are now writing up those results. Um, so those were examples of how you would do the model development in kind of this co-design paradigm, but you still have to then test your model. So we've also done a lot of verification um, of these different models. This is just a, an example from Alaska. Um, and I'll try to move through this a little bit more quickly, but basically in Alaska, it's very unique, right? Uh, but it's, it's, it's unique for a lot of reasons, but it's also very difficult to build a model and verify it. Um, observations are highly sparse, and then that implies there's a lot of uncertainty because you have very few measurements in specific locations. You're trying to project that onto a grid, and then there's complex topography, lots of gradients. Um, so if you try to account for observational uncertainty um, in your model verification, which might be uh, kind of a, a better way forward rather than comparing one line to a, another line and saying that they're different, um, you can see for this observational uncertainty estimate, if you're in the dark blue, if the model's in the dark blue or the dark red, then it falls out of that 10th to 90th percentile. And say from season to season, these are 30 year long term average precipitation for the seasons. You can see generally, you know, it may be out in one season in, a, in an area and then it would be in in another. And, and most of the spaces, it's within that kind of 80% confidence interval. There are some regions of, of pretty confident that we're, there are biases. Then our slope, it's wet, right? It's almost always on the high side of what the observation said could have happened. Um, some of the southern mountains, it, the model simulation might be dry, although I still don't know if I believe the observations there. Trying to extrapolate low elevation stations to high elevations and assuming that lapse rate of precipitation with elevation is constant is sometimes a really bad assumption. And then the uncertainty is still limited by your, your assumptions there. Um, anyway, all that to say is the hydroclimate of the atmosphere looks pretty good. And then demonstrating that through the hydrology, um, what we have here is the long-term monthly flow at two rivers. So the Sestina is the orange one here. The Tanana, which is the headwaters, is a, is a headwater river of the Yukon, or a, a tributary, I shouldn't say headwaters, a tributary of the Yukon, um, just to show an example of where the model performs well. So we have OBS in red, the full land atmosphere model in yellow. And then when we did our optimization, we ran it offline because it's really expensive to run uh, the atmosphere model while you're doing these formal iterations, hundreds of iterations of the, of the land model. And so you don't normally run that in a coupled sense. You have to run the land model offline. Um, all of this to say is that uh, we were able to get really pretty good performance. So this is basically just a skill score of flow at a daily time step. So this is just monthly average to show for vi easy visualization over the long term. But this is a really good skill score. Um, I think it's bounded at one and then can go to negative infinity. And it's Kling Gupta efficiency, if you're curious, <laughs> is a specific thing that hydrologists like to, to use. But essentially, it's just a skill score relative to the observational uh, ob observed flow. Um, right, so it works really well over parts of the Yukon and Southern Alaska, which is great for the project. If you go to the North Slope where we talked about this precipitation bias, it's actually uh, not surprisingly doing worse um, even after optimization, right? So you have biases the land model can't deal with. Um, so that's the challenge of coupled modeling. In an offline sense, you can tune to your biases. You can optimize the bias away, right? So you see better performance in the offline sense because the optimization algorithm knows what that bias is over time. You change the bias, you change the performance of your model, right? So this is the Kuparik and Colville, which are all on the North Slope. The North Slope is also really challenging from a hydrology standpoint. There's a lot of frozen soils, permafrost interactions, and other things that, that go on. And so for communities on the North Slope, unfortunately, maybe you wouldn't want to use our simulations, or you'd have to do other things to, to get them to where you would want to be used, right? So just a quick summary of this. Um, we're doing a lot of work improving our community models, adding new component models to these regional climate models, optimizing, you know, working with the CTSM, CLM team on, you know, how do we optimize hydrology? How do we better integrate hydrology into real, regional climate modeling? Developing these workflows and methods, releasing codes to GitHub. Um, and then, you know, working through how we fuse 
the local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and Western modeling frameworks. So translating knowledge into these quantitative files that can be read into a, a complex land model. And then this, this key thing of performance verification, broad yet focused, how do you do that? <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, and so, uh, yeah, looking forward, there's you know hopefully things with the AI revolution that could be done there. So then now, let's say we have our models, we're happy with our models, then we move to projection development. Um, for the Alaska project, we, we took a couple, uh, a couple approaches to futures. Um, one is uh, thinking about um, how do you relate to communities and community members. Uh, Storylines is kind of a natural fit for that. So this concept of pseudo-global warming is kind of an, a natural for that. So basically, you take historical weather, you add a climate perturbation, you run it forward, you have a future that looks exactly the same as the past as far as the daily weather sequencing, but with a climate perturbation added on. So that's really nice because you can say the storm of 91 might look like this in the future, or you might see hydrology changes like this, stream flow changes, you know, if it's warmer and wetter or cooler and drier, et cetera. And so what we did is um, through a community survey, um, got input on what are the things communities Care about so do they care about you know winter snowpack ice on the rivers uh, the ability to collect berries right so things that are relatable to the community but then we have some hope of translating with our with a social science so it's social I should say a social scientist developed this survey we did not develop, I did not develop this survey Keith Musselman over at CU did not develop the survey. We have Nicole Herman Mercer, USGS social scientist, develop the survey. So that's like that's a key key point to make. Um, and so that went out, and we then worked with the team to translate that into things that uh, a regional climate modeler like myself can understand. So um, annual average air temperature change, and then late winter, early spring precipitation change. So that influences late season snowpack you know, spring melt, and then into the fire season in Alaska. If you have a drought year in the late winter, early spring, then you might have a bad fire season. And then you can take models. They also were worried about mid-century, right? Because the idea of you have to get through now to get to the end of the century, right? So like a lot of folks didn't really want to worry about the end of century. And you hear this at the agencies as well, end of century, like we have to manage through the next 35 years before we get to the end of the century. Um, and that's not new, but we heard it again and again on this project. Um, so anyway, we picked the CMIP 6 scenario, um, this is SSP2, and then we can partition the models based off of these variables, so the, and basically by quartile. So the lowest quartile, interquartile range, high quartile. And then we, for PGW, it's essentially you average the climate model response um, and find the average change. And so the, the yellow and red are the medium and high, so that middle grouping of models and then the highest grouping of models, and those are the two we chose to do our two PGWs. We could afford two, so we could afford a historical and then two PGW futures. And so this just shows the separation of those on these two variables. And then, you know, they separate in the climate space. So looking at what they look like, um, we're working on the analysis of this now. Um, you can see they historic precipitation patterns here and then the two, you know, raw, they don't look that different because there's really high precipitation in southern Alaska. You can see changes like on the north slope, right, there's more precipitation. Then if you do the difference fields, right, there's, in a PGW sense, and in Alaska specifically, it's always warmer and wetter. And so, right, so then you expect more precipitation in higher temperatures, and that's what you see. Um, but what's interesting is that um, if you compare the two scenarios, you start to see this kind of mean response change between them, right? So that actually the, even though the high is warmer and wetter in a domain average sense, spatially they have different responses. So I don't know how well the reds are coming out, but um, the high actually has less precipitation in the eastern part of the domain than the western part of the domain in an average sense over 30 years. And then um, obviously for temperature, right, the highest scenarios lose all the sea ice. And so you have this really strong temperature response where you've lost your sea ice in the Arctic Ocean and the Bering Sea. Um, and then even the difference field you can see, right, that kind of shows a, a sea ice loss signature, and then maybe there's some snow albedo feedbacks in particular places along mountain ranges. Um, so this is really, I think, 
nice to see that it provides us a couple different storylines. And then we've run it through the hydrology and everything, but I'm not going to show that. Um, however, we still heard from community members that they wanted more futures. Um, so this happened right when derecho was coming online. So we were able to submit an ASD proposal and then downscale four of the CSM2 large ensemble members. Um, and that lets us then, you know, show everybody where they are on these variables of interest. And then we've added a few other variables here, right? But where they compare to the two PGW futures. So say this is annual air temperature change versus air temperature change, right? So there's nothing there. And then versus the late winter, early spring precipitation, annual precipitation. So you can see how the CSM2 domain average changes compared to the PGW changes. Um, but what these do is then let us explore a little bit of the circulation change, right? Because these are direct dynamic downscaling. Um, and we selected these four members based off of like the interannual interdecadal variability that's important in Alaska. So uh, Pacific decadal variability was kind of our main indice. And then looking at these charts to try to spread the response around. Um, and then looking at them, right, you can see large differences between the specific members. Um, right, because they have different circulation patterns. And these are actually 30-year averages, I believe. So there's still a really strong uh, circulation response uh, across the different members. And that's Alaska is unique because it has really strong decadal plus variability. Right, so these PDV is a really strong influencer. And, in you know, once we're maybe covering one cycle plus in 30 years. <laughs> um, so there's things we'll have to disentangle there. Um, but I think this is, a, this is a really nice way to to try to show some of the spread that you might see given the variability of the Earth system, right? And so this indicates storm track changes from one member to another, right? So this specific member is gonna say in the future, oh goodness, summer's gonna be really dry. Or is this one say, oh goodness, summer's gonna be really wet relative to historical. Um, and then there's large seasonal variability, of course. So in a mean sense, you wouldn't necessarily catch that. Uh, I think it's cool. There's there's a really strong spring increase versus a strong winter decrease, and this has impacts. Um, so having these few scenarios on top of the PGW scenarios is really nice. So pivoting then to, uh, we talked about storylines. How do we deal with agencies who want it or communities that want to use risk-based decision-making, right? So then you got to do things that are different. You got to be able to model tons of events uh, and quantify uncertainty. So event-based downscaling, statistical downscaling rates, you need to be able to focus in on what you care about or just run a lot of everything if you don't want to use the global models. So in a project with the, the dam safety office, thinking about this probabilistic space uh, and looking at events. So this is dynamic downscaling again, but just focusing on specific events. So we're up here in the hazard space. Um, you know, we know what the hazards are for us on this project. They're defined as floods, too much water. Um, but how often and when and how severe and then, you know, what are the conditions that kind of is handled by reclamation. But so we're trying to develop methods and data sets to improve our understanding of extreme precipitation and what is the change signals of that and then develop technology transfer for reclamation so that they can incorporate it into their regular review cycles. So this operate, operates operationalization of climate change. That is a difficult word to say. So this is some work uh, that Nick uh, Leiberger is in the audience is working on. Uh, we'll hopefully have a paper out next year. But essentially focusing on two reclamation installations of interest, one in the Rockies, one in the Sierras, or just on the, the lee of the Sierras. Um, and really going through the CSM2 large ensemble again. So this is this large ensemble that I've mentioned before without explaining it really, but it's essentially a way to boost our sample sizes from the global climate model. Um, and we can take some members of that that have enough information and downscale them so they have sub-daily output saved, right? And so this boosts our sample sizes. So if we can work with this, right, then we can try to get at probabilistic information. And so again, mid-century, um, and then looking at distributions of events, change signals, and these are I don't know if the simulations are done, but they're close to being, they're done. Okay, well now we gotta do the, now we gotta do the analysis, right? So um, this is very preliminary and this isn't really, the model that's here is not what I'm saying it is. This is from the GCM, not WARF. But this is what we wanna get to, things like this is, if you look at all of the, say, 
biggest events for one day or 15 day, you know, the things that Reclamation cares about, what do the change signals look like? So there's a historical line and a future line. Um, but you can see that change signals vary depending on where you fall on the event intensity, right? And so understanding that is, is critical. And then understanding, does that vary between direct from the GCM, the wharf downscaling, statistical downscaling? Does the change signal change, not just the magnitude? Because the magnitude is going to be biased, but does the change signal change? And so hopefully we can make some progress on that. Um, and then, so we started mentioning statistical downscaling um, and how you get at probabilities. Statistical downscaling is a relatively easy, uh, easy in quotes, because it's still hard. Um, but I didn't mention, so the, all those Alaska runs, that was six futures, 100 million core hours. I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Just poof into heat, which is bad in its own way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, really, that's something that we think, need to think about more. Uh, it's kind of scary some days when you sit like, wow, when you press go on that Q submission to derecho, um, it has real impacts. Um, anyway, so yeah, statistical downscaling, you can do that for a fraction of the cost and you can generate thousands of years, um, but it may miss processes. It may have stationary relationships for variables and so what does that do to the change signals? Um, how am I on time, Chris? Okay, we gotta speed it up here a little bit. So um, Sam, whose last day is today, um, was able to do this really cool thing where she took uh, a method developed by Ethan here in the, in the corner over there um, and actually downscaled a, a, a large ensemble, not just from CSM2, but other global climate models. And so again, a lot of acronym soup. I apologize for that. But essentially, these are three different global climate models that ran their model a bunch of different times. So what this lets you do is kind of what we talked about before, understand internal variability and understand how that changes across models. And so you can start to think about uncertainty partitioning and actually be a little bit more rigorous on what that looks like. And so we downscaled precipitation and temperature, right? And again, like how do you go from coarse to fine? And so yeah, this data set is gonna be really powerful for uh, representation of climate variability through the downscaling step um, it has coverage for all 50 states, and yeah. So these other runs were time slices just for mid-century in one, you know, in reference historical, so 300 years. This is 200 members times 150 years, right? So orders of magnitude more data, but you have to know the assumptions, right? So there's the things with the statistical downscaling that we need to understand. But it is useful for things right out of the box, understanding what our signals are through the downscaling method, what is our climate variability or noise, basically unexplained things. Maybe we can explain them in the future, but not right now. Um, so thinking about our summary here, we have a lot of cool things. I might just move on um, in, for time. So how do we move this into action, right? So we talked about the storylines already on the NNA project. Uh, really, the storyline to define it now, since I've been talking about it, it's these ideas of self-consistent, plausible future events or pathways, right? So a storyline is kind of what you thought. It's an arc of self-consistency through it. Um, and so that's really easily defined through these PGWs because you can define what the future is right out of the box when you design your experiment. And then you can pick events or you could pick certain pathways through that. You can also do that with the CSM2 large ensemble members. It just takes more work. Um, and so we've had a lot of different things on this project. We have an Indigenous Advisory Council. We had a, a summit in Alaska after the pandemic waned. Now, this was actually delayed you know, from COVID concerns. This was supposed to happen in 21. We moved it a full year um, just to, so we weren't, you know, people weren't getting together and all getting COVID. Um, and then um, this summer, we had project team members out in three communities to really try to better understand. And now we're actively developing storylines. Right, So all of these things informed you know, do we model Chinook salmon? Yes. Do we model other species? And then where do we model them? So there's work. Uh, Peyton Thomas, she's a, a great postdoc over at CU is doing the, the fish bioenergetic modeling. And that's a really fancy way to say uh, how much will fish grow in current and future climates given river conditions. 
So that's great for communities. On our agency projects, we take kind of different approaches. They really want to know what data are good for what because they can handle more things, but they can't handle everything. Um, and so I, we'll do one more acronym, SOUP. The point isn't to say we know, you, you shouldn't know what all these acronyms are. The point is to say, my goodness, that's a lot of acronyms. These are all different publicly available downscaling data sets that an agency or community could take and use for their climate projections, right? And okay, what does that mean? What are the change signals? What are these good for? Right, there's often potentially too much information and a lack of clear guidance. Right, so that's where NCAR can do a lot, and we are doing a lot to like evaluate even our own internal methods. Just try to be honest about them and say, you know, we developed this method, but it may not be the best method. Right, um, and what is it good for? Where is it the best? And where isn't it the best? And what can we do to improve it? What can we do to direct other people to improve their methods? So what that looks like, at least from our perspective right now, is developing simple comparisons to more complex standardized tests and then uh, decision support website. So really simple comparisons could be uh, where do they agree on the sign of change. So you could make figures like this, um, the minimum change signal for a mean annual precipitation, the mean, the maximum. How many of your data sets agree on the sign of the change? So here everybody agrees, here two-thirds agree, um, and then what does that standard deviation look like? So where are hot spots of disagreement? Um, an interesting thing is if you take a different climate model, that behavior changes. So you get different agreement maps and disagreement maps, right? So here there's areas where, you know, the change signal isn't all that strong, so that's maybe a little bit unfair, but you have no agreement because half the methods say one direction, half the methods say another direction. And so that that metric and that sign of change is important. You may just have to say, okay, I have to do decision making in deep uncertainty, right? And try to do the full envelope rather than try to reduce. Um, and you also have to be aware of then if it changes by global climate model, if you try to reduce at the global climate modeling stage, then what does that mean for your downscaling and your hydrology? And so there's a set of projects with Ethan, Andy Wood, and uh, others that are trying to like put all of that together. Right, and then uncertainty partitioning, how do we partition this in a quantitative way? Well, we can use what we just talked about, guard lens, to try to quantify at the downscaling step what is potentially irreducible versus reducible. And so just to orient everybody, this is from the global climate model perspective. It's a fractional, so everything sums to 100. If you switch climate models for the Seattle area for mean annual temperature, that accounts for 80% of the total variance or uncertainty. If you go across scenarios uh, as you move forward in time, that becomes more important, right? Because there's more spread in our emissions, the temperature response becomes bigger. And then internal variability for something like annual mean temperature actually isn't that important. At the end of the century, it's all really forced signal. And if you add in the downscaling, um, it looks almost the same. So this is a really nice sanity check that the uh, systems are working and that the downscaling data sets are probably hopefully reasonable for this specific metric. If you go to something like temperature, um, it's a very different viewpoint. Um, so this is from the global climate model perspective, right? It says internal variability for precipitation is important, right? We expect that. Um, but then, and this is very preliminary, so subject to change, I'll put the disclaimer on there. But if you run it through the downscaling scheme and downscaling essentially is like an amplifier, right? It can amplify noise over signal potentially, right? So then it's saying that, uh oh, internal variability is really important. It's more than half of our uncertainty. And so that has implications for what is reducible, what is irreducible, and how you would maybe plan for a future. Yeah, and Ethan's itching his chin. So, but this is a preliminary figure um, that we'll vet a lot more before we publish it. <laughs> I think this was made last week, potentially. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> It's okay for the internal Yeah. Yeah, we should have put the draft watermark here. <laughs> but it's really cool science, and I, you know, it'll be hopefully really enable some really nice outcomes. Um, so data distribution, we're doing a lot of different things with different archives, so the formal archives to make sure there's data provenance, archiving model code, nameless restart files for open reproducible science, also working with other 
teams and groups that actually disseminate information in a usable manner, right? So community reports, summaries of plain language summaries, uh, this Northern Climate Reports is for Alaska only, but they do a really great job. It'd be nice to see stuff like this for CONUS. Um, and for us to be doing those things potentially, you know, maybe that's not our space, but maybe it could be. Um, so the last section is just common themes and I can try to talk about this quickly. Um, so we have some time for questions, but all of this takes a lot of time and it's, it's really hard. It's hard to know what to prioritize. It's hard to know what to manage. And like, there's times where you feel like you're not making any progress, but um, you might be, and you probably are. Um, and all of these projects really benefited. We had really strong existing connections, uh, which is great, but it still required a substantial amount of team spin up. And so, you know, it's even harder if you start with a group of people you don't know, um, right? That's just adds another level of complexity. And so maybe you need to budget more time for yourself, right? But you always are learning even when you have a team that knows itself. You still have new members, you still have new methods. And then again, these tensions of play space versus the desire to regionalize or generalize or to scale up. Um, and I wanna hit on the team building more. Um, the way that we're doing science is definitely different than before. So team building is a really critical part. And this is a really cool figure um, from, from this uh, school course. Um, but team building enables all of these different things, but it's all built on trust, right? And so open collaboration, hard conversations, career growth for yourself and the team and everybody, it's, it all comes from building trust and building team. Um, and so an example of these hard conversations, well, the next slide is a specific example, but right, this, this kind of time and trust and dynamic, interpersonal dynamics enables all of these conversations of being able to say, are we using the correct tool? Do we need to do something different? Are we even doing useful things? Do we need to actually listen to our community partners and change what we're doing? Um, you know, reevaluation and introspection aren't bad. It doesn't mean that you're doing bad things. It just means that you could be doing better or, or maybe it's something is just over the horizon that is even, even cooler and new, right? Um, and so it's always, I think, really important to trust who you work with, work towards it. It takes a lot of time, but it really, I think it's, it's done me really well. Like I'm giving this talk and able to say, like, what is 68 publications or something? That's crazy. That's great. I mean, I know I counted it, but I forgot the number because it was off my CV, which I have to keep updated. <laughs> but anyway, so a specific example on the Klamath, we, we did a year of this innovator project. Then we went out to the Klamath and basically it was, oh, what you're doing isn't good for our community. And you know, it was really questioning what is this project going to be successful at all? And so then we, that's when we pivoted to the fire centric idea, but then found out immediately that the CTSM fire model wasn't fit for this type of modeling. So then we had to come up and Cleo, they did a, his group, they did a lot of work and we kept meeting and it was really not fun at points. Um, I'll be honest, it was, it was hard to go to some of the monthly meetings because they're just like, oh my gosh, we are not gonna get through this project. Um, but then it resulted in this really unique fusion. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud of this project. So just to summarize, there's a lot of neat things happening related to water, uh, co-design, co-production, a lot of, you know, more fundamental Western science model development process science is happening. Maybe didn't highlight the process science here, but it's there. Unique methods and then looking forward to like, right, AIML, it might break the mold in a lot of different ways. It can break the mold in data exploration as well besides just emulating everything that we do. Um, yeah, and I'll stop there. Thank you, excellent talk. Exemplifying, I think, what RHEL does best in terms of convergent science and where NSF is going. So I hope people that couldn't make this talk can see a recording of it. Very good for RHEL. Um, I'll be happy to take questions now, both in person and we have some online potentially too. Um, I, I usually try not to ask the first question, but I need to go, so okay. I'm gonna ask the first question. Um, and maybe it's a question slash comment, like this, what you said is very near and dear to my heart because 
I've done this kind of thing too. And kind of my overarching reflection is having these conversations at the front end of the process is really important because you've got to know like what your community needs are mm -hmm. and how they relate to what science you can give them. And mm -hmm. then there's these menu of options that you have to pick and choose that best relates to the needs of the community. And so the, like, the first 30 to 50% of this is just listening. And if you can do that, you can avoid like those awkward moments of tension, which you alluded to and like, like that can happen at the end in these projects. And, and so I think that's something that we all need to be mindful mm -hmm. of when we're trying to do this with the end goal of like, it's gonna be useful for some decision making paradigm. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's, the earlier you can do it in the process, the better. So the Klamath project was another pandemic project. We actually technically were at the halfway point of a two-year project. It ended up being a third year. So it was kind of in the middle, but we hadn't really done much. So it was, it was an okay time from that point. It would have been nice if it was earlier. Um, I still, you know, I, when I look at another project I didn't mention, RVCC, the Rising Voices Changing Coast, right? So that has had conversations since before the project existed. There's still a ton of tension with the Western scientists. Like, okay, when are we going to do what I know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a different kind of tension, I think, even though we're spending all the time talking with all the communities. It's, it's just, I think it's really just important to be able to have that space, like you're saying. Like, really emphasize, like, it's okay to say, I want to try something different. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, really nice talk, Andy. Um, yeah, I had a question. So I think you went through this of all the different downscaling techniques, which are all useful in their own right. But I'm curious, have you been comparing like what process understandings we can gain from each of those downscaling techniques, especially over Alaska, where you're like, you know, you're doing mm -hmm. a lot of different types of like direct dynamical and PGW to know sort of the limitations and like what mm -hmm. we can understand from each of them. That is kind of happening now, specifically in Alaska. And it is slightly regrettable that the PGWs did not come from the CSM2 lens because now we cannot say specifically it's apples to apples. At the time, we weren't thinking about that because the ratio and the ASD didn't exist. We thought we were going to do PGW only. Um, and then there was a choice of like convenience. And some of the models that went into the PGW couldn't be used for direct downscaling because they only have daily or monthly data, potentially. Um, yeah, so we're trying to tease things out. Um, Dylan Blasky, was a, his name was on there. One of the papers has some work that's in review right now from the streamflow standpoint of comparing the PGW and the CSM2 and kind of responses. But there's a, it's again, like we did all this work to get the data. We're trying to do as much analysis as we can. But like if somebody wants to do that, great. <laughs> that would be great. Any other questions? Hey, and uh, good talk. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on your statistical downscaling method, how the, the methodology? Uh, I could let the developer talk about it, but I mean, so it's so it's a it's a mix of analog days. So you try to find days that look like a day in history from the climate models. You pick a bunch of different variables to define those analogs, say precipitation, temperature, upper level circulation variables, and then you essentially blend that with a, a regression model that tries to fit how those variables relate to your precipitation response, for example, and then that is the relationship that's then used in the future, right? So you have the training data set in history. It relates the historical climate model days to this day in history using these different variables. And then that regression relationship from those analog days is then projected out into the future, more or less. Is, is that? So yeah, I mean, it's more nuances, but that's the <laughs> Yeah, so it's uh, observed precipitation temperature from, say, in situ OBS, but also like, yeah, era five upper level winds or circulations, moisture, whatever you might use. Yeah. Or is that right, Sam? Okay. Yep. 
All right, we have a question online by Cody Polson. In your experience, do community members benefit more from improved model resolution or higher number of ensemble members? I don't often hear the community perspective in conversations around how we develop models for the future. It's really cool you're working in this space. Um, I think we're still a little bit TBD on that. Um, I've seen examples of, you know, uh, community climate plans developed off of straight, you know, full CMIP5 statistical downscaling ensembles, and they've been able to derive some information from that. I've seen also through like Northern Climate Reports and some of the USGS Climate Adaptation Science Center work of trying to do the storylines more. Um, and I think there have been useful outcomes there as well. I just, I can't think of any on the top. For our specific projects, it's definitely still TBD. And that is a, just a good question. There's probably a lot of research that could happen right there from a, a social science perspective is what actually is better. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So I see Tom over here. Great stuff, Andy. Uh, maybe I missed a punchline, but for your Kalamath study, yeah, you, I know you just you said you're writing up the results, but what was the was there a punchline on the intervention? There, there is. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Um, so reducing the density of the forest does reduce ET. It does increase the summer low flows a little bit, but especially in the higher warming scenarios, it gets dominated by the the reduction, the shift in. Uh, seasonality of flow. So this is a basin that's really sensitive to warming, right? So it's gonna switch from snow to rain. And so you have a really strong seasonality shift and then the summer is just dry. And so all the flow runs out and then it's just dry. And so like it, it helps some, but it, the changes from the uh, circulation and warming signals are really much, much bigger. So you should still do it because it does, it's something, but it's not a full negation. Yeah, it's hard. I, we didn't do like, oh, it'll give you 10 years or 20 years. You could run that, but. Okay, well, let's thank our speaker again. And uh, you know where to find him if you have any more questions, but excellent talk. <laughs> and if anyone here ever wants to give a REL seminar, just speak to me. <laughs>